it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Milken Institute's seventh London Summit. Now, as you probably know, and if you don't, you should, uh, the Milken Institute is a publicly supported nonprofit organization whose mission is to increase global prosperity by advancing collaborative solutions that widen access to capital, create jobs, and improve health. We do that through our research, our policy work, and our convenings. And this, of course, is a convening at a very important time. Europe and the world face a confluence of cultural, political, and financial uncertainties. And our panels today are going to explore some of the challenges. They'll include Brexit, disruptive technologies, immigration, global trade, climate change, uh, and much more. Uh, because we are a nonprofit, I want to just acknowledge the fact that we couldn't hold this event without the support of our uh, sponsors, our supporters, uh, including WorldQuant, the conference underwriter, and we'll be thanking them more properly at lunch. Uh, now, let me just give you a little bit of guidance that may help you throughout the day. We have a very full day. There are going to be a great many of you here, approximately 1,000 over the course of the day, um, and perhaps a little more. Uh, so just a little advice, if you haven't done so yet, please download the Milken Institute app. There'll be information there about panel locations and something not in your programs, panel descriptions, as well as biographies of our speakers. And we will not be giving biographies on the stage, they'll all be uh, on the app. Now we're going to be live streaming a number of panels today. Uh, but videos of other sessions are going to be available on our website within a few days. Now this is important because we are at capacity. Uh, you are not going to be able to go to uh, all of the sessions at the same time. I don't think any of you here, uh, as talented as you are, uh, have five split personalities. So you'll, you'll undoubtedly have to miss some. So you will be able to catch up with those uh, online afterwards. And also keep in mind that if for any reason uh, a breakout room you want to go to is full, we're going to be having monitors outside of the room that will enable you to watch the panels. And you can also watch them on our YouTube channel. Uh, this year uh, we are introducing the Milk Institute London uh, Summit on LinkedIn. That's something new for us. And we have a new LinkedIn series. We've asked participants to make one prediction about a trend that will shape Europe over the next decade. So take a look uh, at LinkedIn and join the discussion uh, at uh, 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 hashtag MI Global uh, on your LinkedIn uh, site. Uh, so uh, we'll have many ways for you to keep track. But the most important thing, of course, is just your presence here. You're not only hopefully gaining ideas, new insights that you haven't had before uh, from the panels, but also very much from the discussions you'll have among yourselves. So thank you for being here because the most important part of the conference is the incredibly high level audience that we have here and the interactions you have with each other. So enough of, of the preliminaries. Uh, let's go on to our very first panel, um, which uh, is a uh, a Continental Wake-Up Call, Challenges and Opportunities for a Post-Brexit Europe. And this panel is moderated by Stephanie Flanders, Senior Executive Editor of Bloomberg, Head of Bloomberg Economics. And well, well, join me in welcoming Stephanie and our very distinguished panel. Well, thank you very much. We, uh, we get to say everything that people will be then trying not to repeat themselves to say in the rest of the day. Um, but uh, very glad to be here. And we have an excellent panel to talk about not just Brexit, I promise. Uh, Brexit plus, because really we're wanting to take a European perspective, take stock of where we are relative to maybe a few years ago when things were looking pretty bleak in continental Europe, 
in the middle of the crisis, but also relative to the start of the year when we had so many political things um, up in the air. I'm going to introduce the panel in a minute, but I also wanted to sort of kick out a few opening propositions that hopefully would sort of stimulate a bit of uh, conversation among um, the panellists. You know, the title refers to post-Brexit Europe. Uh, I would argue, Proposition 1, that Europe is post-Brexit, at least psychologically, and was quite quickly moving on to the future and thinking about the future um, after the British referendum last year. Second proposition, Britain is not post-Brexit. And depending on what your view on Brexit, you might think that was a good thing or a bad thing, but it seems to me the very steep learning curve that we would have said Britain had to climb after the referendum. You know, normally when you say, I've had a steep learning curve, that means you've learned a lot in a short time. I think we're very low down still on the learning curve in terms of the overall um, recognition of the trade-offs involved in Brexit, but maybe we had went a few steps up the ladder uh, yesterday in the back and forth over Theresa May's deal or non-deal um, in Brussels. We'll talk a little bit about that. I think the third thing, which I think is particular interest to many of the people of the panel and to me, is that you know, we have chosen to, or we are in the process of trying to leave the European Union at a time when actually the, there's more optimism around the future of the continental economy than there has been, certainly that I can remember, um, but certainly since uh, before the crisis, we may even see um, close to or even above 3% growth uh, in the Eurozone this year, which was certainly not something I was expecting to see. And that is, in a, in a real sense, actually helping to pull the economy together and maybe support politics, you know, that sort of doom loop between the bad politics of Europe and the bad economics conceivably has been broken. Whether it's been turned into a virtuous circle, we don't know, though, because we have some important centrifugal forces still operating, not just Brexit, but also on the east, pulling from the east. We have um, what some people think is really quite um, uh, momentous developments in uh, the rise of populist governments in Central and Eastern Europe, which could uh, themselves threaten the integration of Europe. So it's just, I'm just throwing all of those things out there, um, and I know that uh, speakers will be able to pick up and um, add insight to any one of those. On my far right, we have Mark Wilson, who's uh, CEO of uh, Aviva, uh, Lord Mandelson, uh, former European Trade Commissioner, former many things, British First Secretary of State, now Chairman of Global Council. Michael O'Sullivan, uh, on my left, CIO of uh, Wealth Management at uh, Credit Suisse. Tina Fordham, who's Cities uh, Chief Political Analyst. And on my far left, Michal Krupinski, who's now Chief Executive of the Second Biggest Bank, uh, in Poland, uh, Bank Pekao, but a former Under Secretary of State for the Polish Treasury. So we've got the full breadth. Inevitably, uh, given the timing of this, and given what happened yesterday, I think we have to briefly start by asking you, Peter, I know you've been uh, in Brussels and elsewhere in Europe over the last week or two. You know, how should we read the ups and downs of yesterday, and in, and in more particularly, you know, what is the sort of big picture view on how Europe is looking at Brexit, not just how we constantly look at it? Well, I've been in or talked to people in Brussels, Berlin and Paris in the last week, 10 days, um, and they want to move on. No, clear, no doubt at all about that. Uh, uh, I got a very clear message at a very senior level of the European Commission. The EU27 want to move from phase one to phase two of the negotiations. Uh, essentially, they had decided uh, uh, that, uh, that by the time of the European Council meeting next week, uh, 
uh, Britain will have made sufficient progress in reaching agreement with the EU27 uh, in order to move on to the second phase, which is a discussion. Uh, uh, I wouldn't call it a negotiation. I think that's a rather euphemistic term in this context. Uh, but it will be a discussion in the second phase of this uh, process in which Britain is going to have to make uh, a number of decisions, a number of choices from the uh, menu that uh, the EU27 uh, are going to offer. Uh, Britain has not yet decided uh, what it's, on its own negotiating guidelines for that second phase. Um, the Prime Minister has yet to put to the Cabinet what the goals of Britain's negotiating uh, strategy is going to be. She's not yet got agreement from the Cabinet uh, uh, on uh, what sort of trade relationship in anything other than a purely rhetorical sense will be, what it will, be look, what it will look like, because her priority has been to move her Cabinet and sort of secure its unity to the greatest extent possible on the three issues in phase one. That's you know, paying our tab and how much that's going to cost in order to lead the European Union, and that sort of settled at around £50 billion. Uh, pounds. Secondly, uh, the rights of EU citizens in the future and the role of the European Court of Justice as a sort of reference point uh, uh, in overseeing that. Uh, and thirdly, of course, how the border between Northern and Southern Ireland will be managed. Now, the hiccup that occurred yesterday uh, was that on the agreement over the Irish border, um, which the British government and the EU27 had reached by the end of last week and over the weekend, came apart because the hard Brexiters in the Conservative Party's ranks um, joined forces with the DUP uh, in Northern Ireland uh, in order to scupper uh, what Mrs May was doing. And that, I think, is going to be a continuing feature and hallmark of the trade negotiations uh, in the second phase of this. Uh, because essentially you have the Conservative Party, and this fault line runs through the Cabinet as well, divided between those who want to, at all costs, minimise the disruption and damage to UK trade and the UK economy, uh, and therefore they want the closest possible uh, relationship between Britain and the European Union going forwards. They want the closest alignment uh, in trade terms between uh, the UK and the EU. You could characterise those as soft levers, but that's a very different view taken from uh, others in the Cabinet, led by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and others, who are basically clean breakers. I mean, they don't want that alignment. They prioritise autonomy from Europe, sovereignty, control for Britain, uh, rather than remaining close to uh, the regulatory model uh, of the European Union. And this um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, division uh, basically is going to run through the second phase and Mrs May will do her best to come to an end point uh, where she feels that she's got the, the best outcome in future trade terms uh, for Britain and present that to, the, to Parliament uh, next autumn. But it's going to be a very, very rocky passage indeed uh, for her, for the uh, 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 government. That's assuming, as I believe will be the case, that by the end of this week the DUP will have put back in its box. No, that's a derogatory term. Um, uh, uh, concerns assuaged. I mean, it has been a masterclass in how Ireland, again and again, through centuries of British history, manages to be the crucial <laughs> wrinkle that people haven't thought about enough. I mean, time and again has brought down governments, has been the, has been the issue that people have wrestled with. I want to turn to others, but just well, very... We, we did resolve it in the Good Friday Agreement. Well, they thought it was resolved, <laughs> that's the point. You think it's, you think it's resolved, yeah. and then it comes back to haunt you one way or another. <laughs> I mean, just quickly, because I know some people will be interested in this, there was a conclusion among the sort of commentariat at the end of yesterday or at least a perception, that this might have made much more likely a softer form of Brexit, that it's actually, this has turned out to be the wake-up call for those who thought you could square the circle and actually we're going to end up on with a softer form of, which is very relevant to the business community, that you would end up with something which was 
more or less being in the customs union, more or less being in the single market. Do you, do you think that's something well, business people should be thinking after yesterday? Um, it would certainly be the best outcome for Britain and for the European Union, no question about that. Britain leaving the European Union and the political apparatus and, but in terms of uh, the and political institutional machinery, but we... staying within the economic structures of the European Union. And that option has always been available to us. I mean, the European Union would be absolutely delighted if, in undertaking Brexit, we nonetheless stayed in the economic... But that uh, had regions. been ruled out. Do you think it's more politically possible now? Um, I don't see any evidence right. uh, for it, because the, the reason why the preemptive decisions were taken right at the very beginning to exclude and put off the table what are the best trade and economic options for, for Britain were done by the Prime Minister and the Cabinet because she believed the Conservative Party uh, wouldn't wear it. And uh, I don't see any evidence of a shift in Conservative Party opinion. Look, we, at the moment we're heading on a course in which the default position, and this is the greatest risk facing Britain, uh, is that we leave without a, a real, meaningful, substantive trade deal at all. I mean, we might have a sort of um, de minimis Canada-style agreement in which we remove tariffs on goods, but that won't make a hapeth of difference uh, to that 80% of the UK economy, which is about exporting services and trading those cross-border uh, into the single market. Uh, but if we don't even get the Canada uh, uh, deal, then we will be reverting to WTO uh, rules. Those are sort of minimum average uh, tariffs which go up uh, for different uh, sectors, but again, WTO rules which make no provision at all and do nothing uh, for services. They only govern uh, uh, trade uh, in, uh, in goods. And I think, I mean, I obviously think that's the worst possible outcome uh, for the country. It's also very bad uh, for, for the rest of Europe. But, you know, at the moment, the, the, that is the course on which we are currently uh, uh, set. Uh, in the end, I think it risks blowing up the economy. But if you reverse back down that cul-de-sac, you risk blowing up the Conservative Party. So it's, uh, it, it, we're, in a, we're in a devilish situation, uh, and without a, a really substantive sea change taking place politically within the government, within the Cabinet, I don't really see how we're going to airlift ourselves out of this situation and put ourselves uh, forward and locate ourselves in, in, a, in a better outcome economically for us. Michael O'Sullivan, would you say, sort of stepping back, is, is Credit Suisse, is the, is the wealth management uh, industry post-Brexit in some sense? Are you, is it, is it, is it, are you able to look past Brexit and say, actually, there's all this great stuff happening in Europe? Or is it still a constant worry that Brexit could just confuse and complicate too many things? Well, let, let me do two things. I, I will take up the cause of Ireland, which you just mentioned. Um, and as you said, I will try and look beyond Brexit. Um, so I'm an Irishman living in Switzerland, so I'm biased towards small, small states. Uh, and in Europe, Small states are the best performing <coughs> economies, they're the most stable uh, from a political economic point of view, but they don't get the attention uh, they, they deserve compared to, say, Germany or France. And from a small state perspective, three things at least are germane to the future of Europe and Britain. Um, the first is that the EU is a colossus, and Britain is now finding this out in the negotiations for all of the, uh, the, the tough talk coming out of uh, Westminster. Um, if this was a rugby or, or a cricket test, Britain would be losing 3-4-0 against the, the EU. Uh, and that would be worse if you're, a, if you're a small state. We saw what the EU did to, to Greece over the last four or five years. And if you're Denmark and you want more flexibility on immigration, or you're Portugal, you want more flexibility on the, the financial side, uh, trying to, to, to exact that from the EU would be incredibly hard. So my first... I think observation, maybe recommendations, that small states in Europe will begin to form uh, their own political uh, grouping and, and alliance, and I think they, they should do that. The, the second one is if you look at what European leaders are doing, uh, we've just appointed uh, the new leader of the, the finance ministers uh, in, in Europe. He comes from a small country from, from Portugal. And if you look at, say, Emmanuel Macron's diary, he is much less concerned about Brexit and much more concern about moving on with re, you know, building out and recompleting the, the Eurozone. Uh, and from the point of view, about half of the members of the Eurozone 
This is a big risk because if you have a common monetary policy and you are forced to have common fiscal, fiscal policy, you give away all of your flexibility. And the lesson for me of the Eurozone crisis is that common monetary policy will produce uh, imbalances and distortions in small economies. So they have to have uh, fiscal flexibility. This is not just an argument for low corporate taxes in Ireland, it's an argument for all of the smaller members of the Eurozone. And then finally, uh, there had been a lot of talk about Global Britain, but that's a, it's a canvas, it's a template that is, for me is pretty much empty. Um, and I, I think the model for Global Britain actually is found in what a lot of the smaller economies are doing, Switzerland. And, and the secret of these economies is what I call intangible infrastructure, the, the rule of law, education, technology, healthcare. The UK has got all of those, but I think from a, a cognitive mental point of view, it needs to, to, to reassess where it is in the world and, and focus on this new uh, model of growth. Tina, Tina Fordham, the economics is actually have improved, as I was saying at the beginning, the economics on the continent have improved significantly over the last year or so. There's a perception that populism has at least maybe passed the worst or at least is now uh, in a, um, ebbing somewhat. But then if, you, if you're sitting uh, to the east of different parts of Europe, you don't necessarily feel that way. How do you see the mix of that sort of economic and political dynamic? Well, I think if we um, go back to the start of this year when you know, Trump had been elected and was taking office and uh, we were looking ahead to a, a number of important elections in Europe in systemically significant countries, especially Germany and France, also the Netherlands, um, amongst investors that, that I talked to, a lot of concern that the French elections, you know, if you think back to January, could lead to Frexit. Um, a referendum and so that clearly hasn't happened and indeed we have mainstream leaders um, having emerged in, in, in parties in first place in, in all of these countries but populist parties came in second or third uh, in every single case and although I'm not so concerned about Angela Merkel I think she probably will go on to a fourth term there's no question that her her political capitals undermined uh, and the prospect for uh, European reforms that uh, markets at least had been so optimistic about in this summer with quite a bit of euphoria is now tempered. Um, you, you know, it's, doom loop is exactly the expression I used in my, my outlook paper this year, being full of cheer as I am as the chief global political analyst. Uh, 2017 was de-democratization and deglobalization, and then, you know, the question mark is doom loop because we think back to the Clinton days and that famous slogan, it's the economy, stupid. I think it's not the economy, stupid. Um, Britain voted for, for Brexit at a time of high growth and low unemployment. Um, if we think ahead to 2018, to which elections in Europe are coming up, obviously Italy is the most important. Italy is posting growth for the first time in some time. The Five Star Movement has come in first in nine out of ten of the last polls. And I would venture to say that growth is happening too slowly after a period of stagnation. Um, is not uh, also translating into improvements in living standards for people. And probably the most important variable these days, when I talk about my Vox Populi risk thesis, which is you know, public opinion being more volatile, is, is low trust. Uh, Italy and Greece have the lowest levels of trust in all institutions, government, business, uh, civil society, of any European countries. And that's what's going to probably have the most impact in the polls and won't be reversed on the basis of another half a point of growth, as encouraging as that is. I mean, <clears throat> Michal, uh, you know, I think that the Poland has been such a... Um, previously supportive and energetic uh, member of the European Union. And I think there's been a perception among investors that you know, everything's kind of going right in Europe now, we have Brexit, but actually the economy's doing well. And yes, we now have these rather volatile, unpredictable governments, whether it's in, in Hungary or Czech Republic or indeed uh, Poland. Uh, but things will work out in the end because there's this great economic interest, particularly of the people of Poland, but in these in the other parts of Central Eastern Europe, 
in economic integration. That thing, and, and it just makes me nervous because we had that thought around Brexit and we've had that thought in the past that in the end economics will dictate rather than politics. And as Tina says, it doesn't always work out that way. I mean, would you say that uh, Central and Eastern Europe is still going to be a force for convergence in Europe, even despite some of these political developments? Yes, first, uh, thank you. First of all, uh, Polish society is one of the most pro-European societies in, in Europe. Uh, average support for the EU in Europe post-Brexit is 78%. It is 83% in Poland. Um, at the same time, one of the most uh, pro-American uh, societies in, um, in, in Europe. So far, Brexit hasn't had effect uh, and economic consequences on Poland and Central Eastern Europe. You have unprecedented growth, 4.7% in Poland. Last quarter, Romania is growing at 8% huge uh, confidence uh, uh, boost and uh, highest ever corporate profits. As regards long-term consequences, what we see as potential benefits is, is uh, relocation of services. You had some of the you know, global banks recently announcing um, relocation of, of uh, global services. Poland and C is already a leader in shared services centers. W there is, um, uh, there is a, a, what people consider a chance for, for an economy that there would be some kind of alleviation on labor uh, pressure, meaning people moving um, uh, back uh, to, to the country. Uh, what we, where we do see greatest hope is that there will be a wake-up call, a new opening in, in Europe, a chance for a stronger Europe, a greater focus on, on boosting productivity, particularly in, South, in Southern Europe, a greater focus on, on building um, uh, uh, you know, Eurozone capital uh, banking, uh, banking union. Where we do see risks is, first of all, on the budgets, and this is to your question on convergence. Yes, there will be convergence, provided that the structural funds are, are uh, still at work. Uh, there are concerns around trade. 6.3% uh, of exports from Poland are actually imports here in, in the United Kingdom, and there's a now no fate for, um, for Polish uh, or CE citizens in, in the UK. I think in terms of, of the end game, it is too early to say. I was hoping that a Brexit would provide uh, an uh, incentive for structural reforms in Europe. Uh, so far, I haven't seen it. I don't think uh, people have been held, people in Brussels have been held accountable of Brexit. Because at the end of the day, Brexit is, is not a local problem. It is a European problem. And if you, if, if you take a view that this is a European problem, you should also have, take a view that there should be people held accountable for Brexit and similar problems in, in uh, other EU member states. My worry is that with the EU leaving, you're losing an important ally for a greater uh, uh, integration based on uh, freedoms. Uh, you know, UK, according to the Heritage Foundation, is one of the top three countries in the world in terms of economic uh, freedoms. You'll be losing a, a good ally in terms of security, European security policy, tougher stance on, on Russia, for example, and climate policy. And my worry is, when I look at the recent clashes between, uh, uh, say, France and the CE on the truck drivers question, uh, you know, we are back to what was happening 30 years ago, right? We are questioning a single market if you say you can have Eurozone. Uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's already been raised by one of the panelists. You, can, you cannot have, this is, this is back to the basic books of economics, you cannot have Eurozone without mobility. Uh, and when I hear that there is, there are, the people are questioning free provision of services, I'm, I'm really worried and concerned that this is not a wake-up call. But when you, just forgive me, but when you describe uh, and this is the, the, the description of, of, of Poland's approach is one that would have been similar several years ago, a great supporter for integration, a supporter. Um, and yet you have uh, in control of the premiership and the presidency, the Law and Justice Party, whose leader has been very vehemently against <clears throat> more convergence with Europe, actually talking about bringing powers back. Uh, well, and what about freedom of movement? Well, you and know. so I'm just wondering, yes. it's the, I just want, are we falling into the trap of listening to a business community that is being optimistic uh, rather than the, the reality of, of political dynamics? You know, I look at the, at the slogan that we have here, New Europe, lead, follow or step aside. 
So I think it would be difficult to for, uh, foresee to lead changes without the UK on board, Be because of, of how you vote in, in the EU, basically. I think if, if the answer to the current issues was stronger Europe based on uh, freedoms and economic freedoms, and if, if there was an expectation for further reforms meant to boost uh, uh, productivity and strengthening of the, e of the EU, then again, I think CE would follow. And I'm, you know, I cannot speak on behalf of CE, but I'm, I am talking to people and, and getting, getting their views. But if the answer is further protectionism, then I'm, I'm concerned the answer is, is step outside, which means, which basically means that their poll exit is not any option. Uh, poll exit is not an option. I don't think there's any country in CE that would be in favor of, of, uh, of exit, but there would be further support for what is considered the community of, of, uh, of sovereign states. Tina, do you want? Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, first thing is I, I, I do think that there is a, a Brexit effect uh, at work, which suggests, you know, you, you look at the, the spectacle of these negotiations and the political noise that has been created, and I, I don't expect uh, a European political party to offer an in-out referendum uh, UK style. So I think that that, and that's true for the Five Star Movement. Uh, they've taken a referendum off of their platform in, in Italy, more or less. So they're kind of anti-establishment more generally without offering that. So no, we're not talking about exits, but it seems to me um, no one is talking about the migra migration question and the role that that played both in the, the referendum outcome uh, and indeed in, in Merkel's um, uh, weaker result and the AFD doing better and indeed the tensions between East Central Europe and, and the rest of Europe have more to do with the migration question than anything else in that those countries bitterly resented and indeed rejected Merkel's um, uh, insistence that they take on refugees, and most of them take zero. Uh, and when we have 60 million forcibly displaced people in the world, most of whom are around the European periphery in one way or another, this is going to be a challenge again and again. And it was it was very it was striking in the German election that actually the alternative for Deutschland, uh, the strongest votes were in the eastern. Um, the board yes, areas. but also where there are the fewest migrants, but that's getting yeah. down social science <laughs> nerd um, land. I've yeah. been very patient, uh, Mark Wilson. I mean, taking the perhaps the sort of global perspective on Europe uh, and thinking about how investors and others should look at it now, is this in your, in your heart, do you feel that Europe is now broadly on the right track, will actually be moving in the direction of the right kind of reforms and will be a bit more prepared for the next crisis? Or is there a risk that we're just, uh, in the, the great economist phrase, is mistaking the cycle for the trend? You think that uh, you mistake just a cyclical uptick, a final recovery after years of crisis, for something more fundamental and a, a real change in the mood? Yeah, that's a big great well, morning, Stephanie. The <laughs> Uh, the end of the trend, I think the first law of economics is if something cannot go on forever, it won't. Um, and neither can recession, neither can crisis. But I come from this from both a business perspective and investor perspective, but also a perspective of having lived in Asia for 14 years. And I was thinking this morning, it's a little like a boxing match. So we're in a boxing match. And in, in one, you've heard of the thriller in Manila or maybe the rumble in the jungle. Well, we'll call this the tussles and brussels. <laughs> And in one corner, the great new hope, President Macron, wearing, I don't know, blue trunks with uh, gold stars. And the other, someone wearing the red, white, and blue of the Union Jack. And they're trading body blows, and they're trying to block their blows, and they're fighting for a prize money of, you know, circa 20% of the GDP of the world. And if you pan back a bit and have a look just outside the ring, you have other fighters warming up. You have this 100-foot terracotta warrior from China. You have the sumo wrestler from Japan. You have a cowboy in a 10-gallon hat from the US. And they are fighting for prize money of circa 46% of the world economy. And yet Europe is focusing internally. And, and I think that is a major issue going forward. Um, yeah, even if you have a look at the um, 
island of island issue that uh, we were just discussing. You know, in Hong Kong, in the handover, and I was there for the handover in Hong Kong, you had all these same issues being played out again at that time. And they were issues of borders, they were issues of trade, and it was the UK that negotiated that. I think there's a solution. I think there's uh, precedence for coming to a solution like a, you know, one country, two systems in Hong Kong. Uh, it's not unheard of. And I, I do think that Europe as a whole and UK need to look far more externally rather than navel-gazing over this problem. And just for context, I voted to remain. Mm. Well, I guess we, at any time in the last, I don't know, 20 years or maybe 50 years, we could have accused Europe of navel-gazing and have asked it to look uh, beyond, beyond itself. Um, but there are some real challenges that do need to be uh, addressed. And I think the, the worry, and I don't know who wants to... Uh, respond to this but th there is a worry that you're or maybe or an expectation that it is getting back to as peter said you're almost getting back to some of the old arguments about the core and the periphery and if brexit is happening and if you have a different perspective in central and eastern europe i mean is that a really a fundamental europe that we may a fundamentally different europe that we may see in a few years time uh, let, let, me, let me take some of that up um i mean all that means is that it, it, it is a diverse uh, europe I, I i think that there's from an attitudinal point of view, there, there are several problems uh, in the way we look at Europe. And I think in the Anglo-Saxon countries, the US and the UK, um, there is far too much of a derogatory uh, attitude to, the, to, to Europe as a concept. Maybe, maybe that's conditioned by the crisis of the, of the, of the last 10 years, but you know, the US has got its own issues as, as well. Um, and I think that, that's shown that people underestimate Europe. And, and Europe in the last couple of years is, is doing OK. And I think the negotiations with, the, uh, with, with Britain are, are, are a sign of that. Also, I think we are conditioned, maybe as investors, we're conditioned to, to always expect a, a dramatically uh, negative outcome. I, I, I discount almost entirely any talk of Poland, Ireland, Italy, France leaving the EU. Culturally, emotionally, they're completely different. They're, they are invested in Europe as a concept. Britain was socially was never invested in Europe as a concept. It was never fully in, which is why it's, 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 uh, it's now leaving. Um, and then finally, just to, to bring it to, to an investment point of view, if you are, if you are exercised about Europe and, uh, or excited about it, um, the one way I, I, I found in, in, in the last maybe two or three years, the one link between politics and markets is FX. We've had a very unusual two years in that market volatility has crunched lower, where, where in the world of politics you've had lots of things happening. They haven't appeared to register in, in broad markets, but they do register in FX. So, you know, I think next year the Swedish krona, um, some of the Eastern European currencies, the pound, that, that, that's where you will get volatility. And that's where if you are passionate about Europe for the better or the worse, where you, you'll be able to express that. Stephanie, I, I think that most people in Europe, certainly in the, in, in the political systems in Europe, uh, see both that uh, now is a ripe time for Europe, but also a ripe time for reform of and within Europe. I think they see it in two senses. It's a right time for Europe because let's take a helicopter view of the West or the world. Uh, we have in the United States an administration that is moving the United States somewhat away from engagement with Europe. I mean, the US is going to become less of a, uh, a power uh, within uh, uh, Europe. We see China rising in the East very dramatically with a very serious sense of purpose and a very serious long-term plan. We see Russia uh, on the march on our doorstep. We see chaos uh, to the south of us. So we certainly need to hold together and strengthen uh, uh, the arrangements that we have uh, on, our, uh, on our continent. And we're in a good position to do so because we have put the Eurozone crisis to a great extent behind us. The crisis of, uh, of migrants, uh, of refugees, Brexit has had a very unifying effect mm -hmm. on, on the European uh, Union. But there are big challenges. I mean, the whole architecture and policy framework that supports the Eurozone has got to be strengthened. It's got to be completed. You have probably, at last, uh, two countries, two leaders, Germany and France, Merkel and Macron capable of, uh, of providing the leadership to achieve that, 
on, or on a good day. There are serious economic challenges uh, in, in Europe of, of performance uh, and of productivity, but also of divergence uh, between European economies uh, within the Eurozone. But we're facing a major challenge in respect of our defence and security where Europe is going to have to do more, it's going to have to pool more of its resources, it's going to have to organise itself uh, uh, differently. Now, these are huge challenges. And I think that the, the, the sense in Europe is that, <laughs> I mean, who would have wished it? But because both are, both are different sources of very bad news, both for Europe and the world, but both Trump and Brexit, you know, have had a sort of focusing... Uh, 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 effect uh, on governments in the European Union. I happen to think that the problem pr issues that we face and the challenges that we face in Central and Eastern Europe are, are actually very serious. We have a situation where a, a number of member states of the European Union uh, are not simply moving away from our model of, what, of how the European Union should be organised, but I'm afraid turning away from certain core values and freedoms uh, that we support uh, across uh, uh, Europe uh, and moving in a direction uh, which is not just sort of reorientating those countries away from us sort of institutionally and structurally but arguably rather more fundamentally than that uh, and, and I think that is a, 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 a big issue facing us uh, which we're going to have to come to terms with and I don't think it's that I don't think it's going to be easy. Let Michael come back in a second, but Mark. No, uh, there's, there's two fundamental problems with reform in Europe, because there is a plan. President Macron came up with a plan on a two-stage Europe. Now, part of that plan is unifying corporate tax rates. So if you unify corporate tax rates, you unify regulation, how do small states compete? Why would a company like ours, and we're a very large investor across many countries in Europe, uh, why would a country like ours go to a small state without a tax advantage, or without regulatory arbitrage? It just does not work like that. And so that's the first issue. The second issue is that you know, people like Macron or, or Merkel or others have been very clear that within the confines of Europe, nationalism still plays a big part. And you're seeing the rise of nationalism all across the world. You're seeing that in Macron's stance now, you're seeing that in the US, you're seeing that in China, who wants to be now the, the world superpower. Um, and you know, Francis Fukuyama spoke way too soon in 1993, didn't he? And um, rise of nationalism, if you don't have tax arbitrage, the question for me is how does Ireland, how does Luxembourg, um, you know, how does Poland and, and Eastern yeah, Europe... Mark, can I ask you a question? Sure. If you're just going to continue with an ever-deepening tax arbitrage mm. being practised uh, by large multinational companies, how are you going to have those, see those companies paying the tax that, they, that is due uh, from them in Europe as a whole? Do you not recognise this is a very serious uh, 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 issue which yeah, is, is generating huge public concern? I think the real issue, and I think there's, uh, particularly in the digital world, I think some of it's outrageous. And I think people should You want should to pay deepen the, the arbitrage. <laughs> well, no, mine's, mine's simply a thing of nationalism between countries. How do they compete? So mine's a question. How do they compete? How does Ireland compete? Okay, but what's the answer to my question? Um, I think around, well, uh, in the UK, will UK diverge in a post-Brexit world? Certainly. No, I'm asking a different question. My question is about very large international companies uh, that manage to play different tax jurisdictions off against each other, exercise uh, arbitrage in a way and on a yeah. scale that we have not seen, which is leaving government short of taxation and the public very, oh. very angry. How are you going to address that? So I think that's a fundamentally different question. That is tax avoidance. It may be, but it's not a bad uh, Well, let, let me finish then. <laughs> that, that is a question of tax avoidance. Yeah. If people are going and routing revenues through a country, that's tax avoidance. Don't agree with that. If but that's one thing that the small states inspire by having the lower rates. If, if people, though, are moving jobs to a country and doing legitimate business there, there's always going to be different taxation regimes in the world. Let's give you an example. France, uh, only in the last month, have taken off their wealth tax, which has been there for 32 years. They're doing that very openly to encourage people to come back to France. 
my question for you, Peter, is that a legitimate form? Now, you may suggest it's not. I would suggest that's a legitimate way that their government is trying to involve investment. I think it's a very sensible and progressive move by mm. uh, Macron, uh, because I think the wealth tax uh, was uh, punitive, but worse mm. than that, not bringing in the revenues for which it was originally designed. I think people are probably going to end up paying uh, a fairer, more progressive tax in uh, uh, France well, as a result I of the removal of that, of that wealth tax. But again, that doesn't really address the question I'm raising, uh, which is uh, that you know, we, we have a very serious situation in which large international companies themselves, and they've told me this, mm. do not feel that they are paying enough tax. They do not feel they're paying their fair tax due in Europe. But the system does not mm. require them to pay more tax. What are they going to do? Voluntarily come along to the Inland Revenue Office and write a cheque? Of course they're not. But they also, uh, uh, domiciled in the United States, headquartered in the United States, face a different problem too. And that is if we change arrangements uh, in Europe uh, so that these large, you know, US basically tech companies uh, have to pay more of their fair whack in Europe, I'm agreeing there's going to be a huge backlash in the United States, starting with its president, saying, America first, thank you very much. If you're paying more in Europe, you're going to pay less in, in the United States, and we're not going to have that. So they're in quite a dilemma. Mm. Yeah, I, they mean, are. I mean, just to, I mean, stepping back a little bit, much though I enjoy the little um, Barney on the right-hand side. Um, <laughs> the, uh, excite the I know, it's very, it's yeah, very exciting. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, you know, there is a question actually raised by something that Peter said, but this is an example of one of those issues. You know, at the beginning of the year, we might have seen that a glimpse of the possibility that at the end of this year, there would be this reinvigorated Franco-German core. You know, we've talked about the, the centrifugal forces, uh, still uh, concerns in Europe. But the expectation was that you would have this set, the center would be holding much more strongly because you would have Emmanuel Macron and you would have a, a revitalized uh, Chancellor Merkel able politically to push forward and, some, and come up with solutions to some of these questions. What was a more integrated Europe going to look like? Tina, do you think we are, are we within sight of that? I mean, Peter says on a good day, we've got that uh, in the next few weeks. What do you think, or the next few months? Well, I th as I said, I think that we're not looking at more exits. And so the, the, you know, the biggest uh, aspect of the European crisis for a company's investors was Euro breakup. You know, the euro is not going to break up. Michael's right. Americans in particular underestimate the durability of the European Union. But for me, fragmentation risk continues to be the most significant one. So we're not going to have an Italian exit because there won't be a referendum. We're probably going to have a minority government with support spread across five parties. Uh, Theresa May, I don't care what anybody says about the political logic, could very well uh, be forced out or, or a step down. She's one crisis away, in my view, from that, even if fear of Jeremy Corbyn in number 10 is, is what keeps the, the Tory party together. That could take place in the same period as uh, when the UK needs to get a deal in, in March to, to, you know, to really give a, a signal to, to companies. Merkel is going to spend the next three months easily uh, trying to negotiate a new coalition, so you won't have a German, you'll have a German caretaker government in effect at the same time as we're trying to do all of this. The, we haven't talked about the, the Catalan developments, uh, which I think were significantly underpriced, mm -hmm. not because I think Catalan independence is, is coming, but because it may be that the wave of anti-establishment and Eurosceptic sentiment is replaced by something more like regionalization instead and a return of identity politics. So, uh, you know, we have Swedish elections also next year. I have always said the core countries were more at risk uh, for anti, um, you know, Eurosceptic movements converging with the anti-immigration sentiment. I think that's still true. Hungary also next year. I think Michael Sullivan's point, though, about markets not registering this political volatility is a really important one to, to come back to. Because first of all, it's never been the case that political risks really had much impact on, on equity markets, right? And, and part of what you guys were talking about with uh, arbitrage on, on, on regulation and tax is part of that. Multinational corporations, you know, the S&P is, is breaking uh, records every day. Where does political risk end up having an impact? It's, it's local currencies. 
Uh, it's on the bond markets, but it's also on investor sentiment and FDI and, and everything else. And so that's sort of been implied uh, in our, across our, our conversation today. Um, but it's also going to be what's really at stake for Europe going forward to get control of this narrative and to uh, minimize the potential for, for further fragmentation because it's political capital that's required to do any of these things that we're talking about. I mean, as an economist, I think the, the reality check I always have is whatever's happening now, how do we think Europe is going to be placed come the next recession? Because we know there'll be another recession. Have any of the things fundamentally that created the crisis last time been addressed? I think you could argue that some aspects have been addressed um, in some parts of the banking system. But if you look at Italy, you mentioned the politics of Italy. The economics of Italy are still pretty challenging. You look at the, the nominal growth rate on a, on a really good day uh, over the next few years, the most optimistic forecasters would still have the growth rate lower than the cost of servicing the government debt. Um, so just at a fundamental level, they're no further away from a debt crisis than they were a few mm. years ago. They're not on the verge of one. A bit further away from a banking crisis, though. Potentially, <laughs> although, again, you have that connection between the, the banks and the sovereign, which has not been resolved by the crisis. Um, so I just wonder, I mean, Michal, some concerns being raised here about the potential rejection of some European values by the current government of Poland and by others uh, in the region. Come the next recession, do you think you could have the same continued optimism about support for Europe? And this isn't so much about Poland necessarily leaving, but just being a destructive force. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, remember, Poland was the only country to have avoided last recession because of uh, resilience of its economy and the big contribution of experts to GDP that actually doubled uh, 10 years ago. I was actually at the World Bank IMF at the time. We were dealing with a number of issues in, in the CE. Um, so now, but in terms of the, of the previous question that was asked uh, about the future, I actually read uh, Europe's history or EU history in French. And in French they say, I remember a French professor telling us, toute crise suivi d'une relance, which means each crisis is followed by a relaunch or revival. And then you, when you look back 60 or 70 years down the road, the, you know, there was the Hague Treaty and then the Maastricht Treaty and then the Euro. So I'm, I'm optimistic, right? What I'm concerned about, and the, this, was, this is something that you have mentioned, is that we have unprecedented growth globally, 3.7. Uh, you know, highest growth in, uh, in G7, uh, G7 economies in full employment, uh, which is not good because this doesn't create a sense of urgency uh, for reform. So indeed the question is, you know, what if it comes 2019, 2020, global markets run into some kind of problems and then we would be faced with an even more increased acute problems, uh, particularly in some countries in Europe which have been facing unresolved uh, uh, economic productivity and, and uh, social uh, uh, problems. So I would say the, the future will show. At the same time, I also remember it was one of the founders, Jean Monnet, who used to say, Europe will not be created by grandiose ideas, will be created by concrete tasks and concrete accomplishment. Uh, it was around the time of coal and uh, steel community. And when I think about the concrete things that can be done and thought about, uh, including by Franco-German Nexus, this could be uh, you know, how you integrate uh, European banks even further. I mean, why don't we come back to talk of uh, mega mergers in Europe? Mm -hmm. I think a mega mergers in Europe in any sectors, in TMT and banking and finance, would have created a very big boost of confidence to Europe as such, um, to the market. Um, and, and this is something that can indeed be accomplished globally because what we are trying to avoid here is, is a further marginalization of Europe. When you look at the contribution of Europe's GDP to global per capita, it has been in declining trend and the risk is when you have UK leaving and UK is attracting one third of, uh, of uh, FDI in the EU and it constitutes one third of, of uh, equity markets capitalization. Um, then, then you do have a risk of further, of further marginalization. I think we should, not, we should also think about, about um, say, a new wave, a fourth industrial revolution, and what is it that Europe can actually accomplish 
uh, in terms of new technologies, in terms of, in terms of uh, innovations. This would, in my view, be a very forward-looking um, uh, forward statement, but I think it has to be a, a very concrete task and very complete accomplishments. I wouldn't be worried about Poland or any of the CE countries um, not to be in favor of, of such uh, bold moves. Just on, to, to end on a cheery note on, on recession, um, <laughs> I, I think if the next recession comes, I don't think it will be led by Europe. China has more imbalances, the US is further ahead in the econo economic cycle. Uh, and in Europe in the last maybe six years, we've had uh, risk cycles, not business cycles. We're just getting into the business cycles. And I think consumers and corporates in Europe in general don't have much leverage. So if there is a downturn, I, I, I personally don't expect it to be severe in Europe. Um, there is a risk, of course. We, we haven't spoken about the, the true leader of Europe, who in my view is Mario Draghi. He's the one, uh, I, I think from a sort of moral and leadership point of view, is the one to, to stand out as a leader. Um, and next year, I think it would be a big swing year for the ECB. Uh, we may see a pick up in inflation uh, in Europe, and the ECB may be a force to, to adjust its, it, the ending of its QE program. Um, and that may eventually bring some of the political risks at the periphery back into the, to the market space. So for me, uh, that, that really is the risk for, for next year. Mm -hmm. Agree on Mario Draghi, by the way, uh, and he's going to be badly uh, missed. Uh, I think it would be a good idea, neither for Germany nor France, to put forward a candidate to succeed him. I think it would be better to look to an Irish or a Finn uh, to fill that uh, post, uh, because I think we are going to see a, a necessary sort of intensification of Franco-German leadership in Europe, and that should not sort of be confused with monopolization of Europe by France and Germany. Uh, I think uh, Germany that has spent so many, so many years, for very good reason, bemoaning the absence of a partner uh, in Paris, uh, now has to recognize that in Macron, it does have a, a, a partner. I think that Germany for too long has been a bit of a bean counter. You know, I, 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 I think that Germany has looked at every step that it could take in uh, uh, Europe as a zero-sum game uh, uh, for themselves. I think they've got to, once they get a government, uh, they've got to sort of lift themselves out of that man mentality and recognize that uh, in Ma Macron, by no means perfect, obviously, he's after all only a politician, um, uh, he, 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 this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. I mean, here is a guy, Macron, who has the temperament, the capability, and the majority to undertake serious reform in France. Mm. We haven't seen that for generations uh, 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 in that, uh, uh, in, in that uh, country. The French public are showing amazing patience they're in a sort of wait and see mode. They're not instinctively rejecting every sort of change that's being proposed, proposed and, uh, 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 and taking to the streets. The far right has lost momentum in France. The far left uh, has lost traction uh, in France. This is a very, very propitious uh, uh, moment in view, in my view. And what Macron now faces is three essential tasks. One is to drive uh, economic uh, and societal and state reform in France in a really serious-minded way, in the way that he started, but he's got to continue. Secondly, he's got to turn en marche into a bigger permanent political movement. I mean, people have really got to have the sense that this is not a sort of flash in the pan, uh, that, it, that it represents a serious and, uh, and permanent uh, structural change. Uh, in French politics, and then he's got to lead not just in France, but in Europe as well. He can only do that uh, uh, with Germany, and it is Germany's time, once they have their uh, uh, coalition in place, and I'm glad it's looking like it's going to be more like a grand coalition with the Social Democrats rather than a Jamaica-type coalition with the Greens and the populist uh, uh, liberals. It's Germany's time to step up to the table as well. We've right. got to see that in Europe. Right, so from you, Peter, we've got instructions for France and Germany, um, the sort of wake-up call that you'd like, like them to have. We've got a tiny bit of time uh, for others to just give us a, a very kind of 
uh, final um, comments, I guess it would be, you know, what's the one thing, if we really think we're now looking at a more optimistic view of, of Europe, certainly compared to a year ago when many people were quite bleak and certainly investors were very down on Europe, um, what should we be looking for, uh, for, for sort of a, a clue to how this is going to work out, whether this will be fundamentally different? Very brief. Well, uh, I think we should be following Macron's lead. He's got a very simple agenda, pro-reform, pro-business, in his case, pro-Europe. Um, I think the pro-reform, the pro-business is fundamental to economic growth. And it's, a, it's about time the UK government and the UK opposition realised that, woke up and realised that pro-business is going to help the economy of this country, that's first. I think looking externally rather than internally, we've got, we should be doing trade deals with the US, with Japan, with China. Um, Peter knows more about that than anyone else, I expect. And if we look externally, once we resolve these issues, and I think we will resolve these issues, I think it can be a, a nice future. What should we look at? Very quickly, two things. Um, small countries as a coalition uh, and as a policy leadership group. Um, and then I think for the next four or five years, the, the interplay between monetary and fiscal policy across the Eurozone countries would be the big arbiter of success or not. I think you're right looking at what happens to the ECB next year. Yeah. Sure. Tina. I think there's uh, one useful common denominator if we look at Macron and uh, even Sebastian Kurz and in Austria and with Italian elections coming and the, the new leader of the Five Star Movement seeming to, to gain traction, they're all under 50. Um, there is a real appetite for a changing of the guard and uh, the, the issues that Europe and, and all industrialized democracies face, automation of the labor force and, and these kinds of things are not being addressed by the generation of, of older leaders. Michal. Reform versus protectionism. Secondly, accountability versus blame game. And thirdly, don't forget that seven out of ten biggest companies, listed companies, are somehow related to fourth industrial revolution. Mm. Well, thank you, everybody. I can't help feeling, uh, and it's going back to something Tina said, that we're still <coughs> focused very much on the economic story, the pro-business, the pro-growth story, and our growth is very important, but um, economists, someone, a very distinguished international diplomat said to me once that you know, it was true that politicians didn't really understand the fundamental rules of economics, and we learned that lesson the hard way in some of the financial crisis. But economists and people in the market sometimes don't understand the rules of politics. I hope we're not making that The mistake. rules of politics are changing. Peter it's, Madison's a good one to ask about the rules of politics. <laughs> but the rules of politics <laughs> used to be about left and right. Now, left and right still exists, but actually there are new rules in politics. They are about insiders and outsiders. And how we recognise that, understand it, cater to it and come to terms with it is the big political challenge for the West in this century. I knew you would get the last word. Thank you very much. <laughs>